Good evening. I'm Dr. Rasan Harris, CEO of Business Committee for New York City. I want you to take a moment and grab your phone and grab a glass uh, because we want you to be able to enjoy this evening and this time with us. Um, we wanted to take a pause and we've been doing this uh, all summer long and we're very excited about our summer session. Summer's coming to an end, uh, but the impact of the pandemic on us uh, still lingers. Um, so the need to come together as a community to improve New York City has never been more important. Uh, so I want everyone to raise a glass to yourselves because uh, you are the fighters for democracy. You are our heroes. You are the people who rebuild New York. Um, so thank you for all that you do. We're excited about a very exciting conversation we'll have tonight. Um, uh, folks who are our heroes locally um, and have great stories to tell. And if you like what you hear, if you like what you've heard in the other summer sessions that are available on our YouTube channel, we'd love for you to um, make a donation, support the work, um, take out your phone and point it uh, on the photograph camera at that QR code that you'll see up on the screen. It will take you to our website and direct you to how you can support our work. Citizens Committee for New York City makes small grants that are really meaningful for local leaders in New York City that are part of the rebuilding. And uh, New York City is going to need their champions and fighters to bring us back. And your grants um, that are supported uh, by your donations uh, will help bring the city to where it needs to be. Um, so we thank you uh, for participating. We thank you for sharing that you're here tonight and sharing our work. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Paul Deutsch, who is the chairman of our summer sessions. He's been a fantastic champion of our work and really thankful for Paul and our tonight's special guest. Thank you, Rasan. I appreciate that. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight for another fantastic edition of Citizen Summer Sessions. You guys are in for a real treat. Uh, before we get started, though, um, let's talk about tomorrow. Uh, it's the 19th anniversary of 9-11. And as we've rightfully done every year since, we're going to remember the close to 3,000 people who died on the single worst day in our country's history. But there are other things that we need to remember from that day as well. Things like the heroism of New York's first responders and everyone who worked tirelessly at the site for weeks and months after the towers came down. We need to remember the New Yorkers from all over the city who came to help. They volunteered their time, their money, their strength, their love to help their fellow New Yorkers at their most desperate hour. Even when New York was at its worst, New Yorkers were at their best. Now, I mention this not only because of tomorrow's anniversary, but because New Yorkers helping New Yorkers is what Citizens Committee really is all about. The money we raise tonight will be distributed to grantees throughout the city. These grantees have one sole and absolute ambition. That is to help their less fortunate neighbors in the neighborhoods in which they live. And now in the, well, we can only call the year of COVID, the need is that much greater and the help that much more important. Please use the QR codes on your screen. Please make a donation. Anything is good. The help is, is greatly needed and greatly appreciated. Now, as I said, you are in for something special tonight. We have two very special guests. The first is Alexander Smalls. Alexander lives in Harlem, where he's a restaurateur and co-owner of the celebrated Harlem Jazz Club Mintons. As the former chef and owner of Cafe Beulah, the first fine dining low country restaurant in New York City, the Cecil, and more, Alex has received great acclaim in the restaurant scene, including being named one of Zagat's 19 restaurant power plays in New York City. He's a best-selling author, award-winning author, and his newest book, Meals, Music, and Muses, was released in February 2020. It is a delicious tour of the South through recipes and music. By the way, donors who, who uh, donated at least $250 during our event today will receive a special signed copy. And more than a cookbook, each chapter is inspired by different musical tradition and it takes readers on a delicious journey through the South and essential African-American recipes to examine the food that has shaped the culture and region. Our other guest tonight, our moderator is Lisa Cortez, an award, Academy Award and Emmy nominated film producer, a celebrated director, and the founder of Cortez Films. 
Lisa has brought to screen numerous documentaries and poignant narratives, including the Academy Award-winning Precious, the Apollo documentary, the remix, hip-hop and fashion, and the upcoming All In, The Fight for Democracy. Lisa is a longtime friend of Alexander and a fellow Harlemite. And with that, I turn it over to the two of you. Welcome and thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rizan. Thank you, Citizens Committee. Um, I have to tell you guys, you're, you're getting an insight into something that happens on the regular. Mr. Smalls and I chatting about our lives, our journey, the wonderful synchronicity that brought us together, and a good old bourbon and ginger ale. <laughs> Do I? Yes. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. <laughs> Cheers. We have made it. So Alexander, um, you know, I want to like uh, talk to you about so many things, and I'm I got the clock ticking, but I want to start out with like who you are, and I'm looking at the dedication in meals, music, and muses. Yes. Recipes from my African American kitchen, and you dedicated it to your parents, your parents' parents their parents, the ancestors, those whose silent voices and extraordinary challenges shaped the world you inherited. Their hardships, sacrifices made my life more meaningful and promising. Because of them I am, I stand on their shoulders, grateful, thankful. So, Alexander, let's rock and roll. Wow. Who are these amazing people who that informed your journey. Well, Lisa, uh, I'd like to just take uh, a quick moment and thank citizens uh, for having us and for allowing us uh, to do what we normally do all the time, which is, you know, sing and praise. Uh, the blessings that we've received and always looking for opportunities to share, you know, love, grace, um, and, and you know, this peace we found. So I'm very thankful for that, and I'm really happy you're here. And all of that to say, it gave me time to completely forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alexander, you know, I wanted to start with, like, who are you? And... And I read that beautiful dedication to your parents, your parents' parents, your ancestors, and and tell us about that the the foundation of your origin story. Well, you know, it's extraordinary. I mean, I am really a mere vessel of all of that. The generations, the legacy, the teachings, um, the sense of purpose that I inherited from really strong, proud Black folks from the South whose um, main objective for me was to make sure I was purposeful, that I was um, uh, dedicated to doing good, positive uh, things to elevate, uplift, um, and never embarrass the family, no matter what. <laughs> so, you know, they armed me with, um, you know, extraordinary tools, um, you know, beyond the human aspect of kindness, generosity, um, charity, uh, uh, consideration. Um, they gave me fundamental tools. I used to work with my grandfather in his garden. He was referred to as a city farmer. And, uh, you know, in that field where, and where were you where were you sorry tell us where the, the where you were what oh yes you? well okay i hail from south carolina um my family uh, originally from charleston and buford south carolina my grandfather moved the family to spartanburg um in the northeast part um but as he moved us there and that's where i grew up we brought all the customs and traditions from the low country um my household was so different than, than my friends. What we ate, uh, the way uh, my family spoke and uh, referenced um, uh, low country uh, Geechee lore, uh, I didn't experience that in anybody else's home. 
And so my father, having started as a farmer, my grandfather, sorry, having started as a farmer, he brought that tradition and in his backyard, every year had about a half acre farm, which I spent my youth seeding, growing and planting um, and sharing his stories um, in that garden. So those are my beginnings, really. And, um, you know, it's, we're going to talk a little bit more later about low country culture, cooking. Can, for those folks, for, for the northern folks on the line tonight, can you give us <laughs> kind of, you know, some of the tenets of, you know, the um, food, vocabulary, uh, style of, of, of the low country? If well, you, you know, one could unpack it that way. What we have to understand is that um, uh, just like in other countries, you know, the, 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 the food, particularly food inspired by the African diaspora, is regional food. I mean, we essentially, there is not just one um, uh, label that really speaks to uh, the kinds of food we eat in the South. Now, the Low Country is a really particular area, um, very much close to the roots of West Africa uh, and the Caribbean. Essentially, um, Charleston, uh, along, interestingly enough, with New York City, probably welcomed and received more uh, enslaved people than any other part of the United States. Um, uh, and so, uh, in the Gullah Islands, which are off the coast of Charleston and, and Beaufort and Savannah, uh, many of those rituals of West Africa and tenements of, the, of that, that uh, region are still very much alive and, and uh, practiced. So the food and the richness of West Africa was more akin, say there, than when we moved up country to the Piedmont where the food was more, um, um, I would say, Americanized. You know, there was a there was a pure African influence in Low Country cooking, and and people lived off the land as well. You also have to remember that uh, in the Low Country, um, the wealth was built on rice, and rice grown in the Low Country supported the thirteen original colonies, and the fortune of of of. Uh, the plantationers in the South. So you're growing up and you're working in the garden. How does food enter into your narrative? Well, you know, on many levels, uh, clearly uh, <laughs> from the garden, um, but also, uh, you know, my grandfather uh, rented farmland outside of the city where he raised livestock. And as a young boy, and I was, I was really attached to my grandfather's hip. Wherever he was going, I wanted to go. Um, so at a young age, I would go and feed the livestock with grandpa. I would be there on the days when the animals were slaughtered. Um, we would load the, the fresh um, uh, meat into my grandpa's truck and at home, my aunt, uh, who was a chef, my uncle, who was a chef uh, back in the day in Harlem and had moved back to South Carolina, um, they would all be waiting to butcher this meat and distribute it between my parents' home, my grandfather's home, and my uncle's. I was in the middle of all of it. Uh, you have to understand that it's Southern Black life, particularly of the Gullah, uh, uh, Geechee region evolves around food, whether it's the garden, whether it's quail hunting, venison hunting, whether it's uh, crabbing and shrimping, which we did all of that as a kid. Um, we would load up a car at 4 a.m. and drive to Charleston and Buford and spend time there with relatives, come home with butchers of crab and butchers of shrimp and the big black pot in the backyard would uh, be boiling newspaper on the picnic table, and there would be a party around preparing all of these things. I couldn't escape 
food. My father worked in the grocery industry <laughs> and had a nightclub. <laughs> and, uh, and two uncles were chefs. One aunt was a chef. And my mother's father was a chef. So food was king. Ab absolutely. Um, let's get in the time machine. What's <laughs> one of the first th things that young Alexander prepared? Wow. Well, you know, in my first cookbook, Grace the Table, uh, which is essentially a book on how I became Alexander Smalls with recipes at the end of the chapter, my first meal and continues to be uh, a principal comfort food in my life was beans and franks. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, to the day I will go out of my way for beans and franks. There was something about... Um, um, my parents, uh, on, on every Friday night, it was fish on every Saturday night, it was steak. And I really didn't want to eat parts of any of it. The fish had too many bones and I didn't know that you could cook a steak rare. Uh, so when my mother finished with it, it might as well have been a shoe. And I, 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 I really, uh, would get excited about beans and franks. And so she, anything I loved because I wanted it all the time, she would make me learn how to prepare it. So at the age of four, I am standing on a chair, you know, with my with my butter and onions and celery and peppers, you know, sizzling in a pan, and then that can of pork, pork and beans, um, and then the franks that I've chopped up, and that simmers with ketchup and brown sugar and chilies, and over some white rice, I could live forever. <laughs> okay, so Alexander, do you realize that most four-year-olds do not know about peppers, onions, chilies? You were obviously mimicking. Who were who was it that you were mirroring when you uh, met yeah. four? Well, I mean, you know, my mother was an extraordinary salt and pepper cook. Um and, and, and could work wonders. I mean, she didn't venture into a lot of exotic spices, she, but she knew how to manipulate the familiar and make extraordinary dishes. But as a child around the age of seven or eight, uh, my aunt and uncle who had been living in Harlem, my uncle, um, a chef uh, in restaurants all over New York, um, and had known Edna Lewis, one of the uh, sort of the original Alice Walkers, um, uh, the original farm to table. Um, uh, and he ran in that circle and my aunt was a classical pianist. And so when I was born, they had tried to have kids for many years um, only to find out uh, much later in life that my aunt was much older than my uncle and he found that out after 40 years of marriage and it was time to collect social security. But that's <laughs> another story. <laughs> so they packed up their, their antiques and their heirlooms and their fine linens living in Harlem and came back to South Carolina. And um, they uh, essentially took over my education. And between my aunt with the classical music my uncle's love for opera, uh, Renata Tobaldi, Birgit Nielsen, um, Collis, uh, and his very quirky way of cooking because he was the guy who taught me that imagination was necessary ingredient for everything you cook. They really galvanized and taught me about spices and taught me about dreaming up dishes that end up in a pot of, of odd and expanded uh, ingredients. And, you know, this really set everything in motion because from a piano student and my love for opera, I announced one day to my parents to their great horror that I wanted to be an opera singer. And since they knew no one who looked like me or them that did that. I mean, they, they thought they were raising a doctor, a lawyer, uh, because the value of education was so important. Maybe the first black president, but an opera singer, where do we go with that? And, and, and 
And who's ever heard of such a thing? <laughs> So, so Alexander, it's, it's you know one of the things we we haven't talked about is that you are you're growing up in the South. We're, we're we're and the South is you know during this time we're still seeing violence and intimidation against black bodies. You still are being first, and you are you're integrating. You know, you're tell us more about kind of that other world because you're the family world is is this beautiful full picture but how are you is everyone balancing right. with each other well you know my parents went out of their way to shelter us i mean um they made sure in their unique way that we were completely oblivious to racism uh and segregation i mean it 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 really didn't occur to me you know, until I took a road trip with my grandfather and my grandmother and had to go to the bathroom and I couldn't use the bath. Otherwise, I was completely oblivious because it was so important to my parents that we not live with the stigma of second class. And, you know, I, my hat is off to them. But, um, you know, one of the things... <laughs> One of the things that I found myself doing was integrating almost everything I was involved with. I mean, here I am running around the South, little black boy reciting Shakespeare and sonnets, um, uh, uh, singing in French, Italian, and German, um, having cultivated this kind of European sophistication, you know, that uh, I didn't run into too many people, black or white that fostered that sensibility. So uh, in high school, I found myself integrating um, the white high school. I didn't, I didn't mean to. Um, I needed a calculus course uh, uh, and the black school did not offer it. Um, and so I had to go to the white school. And, you know, this was pre, um, mandatory integration, um, I mean, which happened in 1970. So this is 1968. And here I am, this little black boy in an all white class studying calculus. Um, and things went so well. And then, you know, at the white school, they learned that I was um, a thespian and also uh, a singer. And they went out of their way to, uh, to get me into the school. So I was one of the first blacks in the, the local high school, you know, before, you know, the Ku Klux Klan knew anything about. <laughs> that's, quite, that's quite a feat, to, but one of your many firsts, you know, that's why we say, Alexander, you have a list of firsts that you so gracefully have inhabited. So, so then let's, you know, moving through time, I want to get to opera and Curtis, and then going, your, your career as an opera singer. Yes. Well, you know, I mean, um, much like uh, my Southern neighbor, uh, but uh, years before me, Nina Simone, um, who was a child musical prodigy in the South. And of course, a musical prodigy in classical music in the South really needed to move up north to realize any possible opportunity. Uh, so I like to say I was following in the steps of Nina Simone, who had had a, a, a short stint at uh, Juilliard, but um, everything was going into the hope and desire that she would get into the Curtis Institute of Music, which was uh, the premier music school uh, in the country. Uh, and if you got in, all your expenses were paid. Um, it was a very elitist school, and essentially they accepted, while they received many, many, many applications, they, they only accept a few people. Um, Nina Simone did not get in. They simply weren't ready for her. Uh, and I have to say that also Paul Robeson uh, had an association with Curtis as well, the Curtis Institute being in Philadelphia. But here I come, years, years, years later, I get into Curtis. 
Curtis, um, uh, the year I auditioned, there were about 600 applicants and they took about 14 people. And I was one of those people. Um, and so things were moving promising uh, when you think about um, my mother's and my mother and father's trepidations about, you know, this little black boy trying to secure a position in classical music and opera. Uh, and what could that possibly lead to? Um, the fact that I was progressing uh, and had gotten into the prestigious Curtis Institute, it looked good for me. And so uh, essentially I, I launched my career. I had the good fortune of the Houston Grand Opera uh, coming to town uh, to do a production of the new Porgy and Bess with the electrifying, exciting soprano Clama Dale, who was just taking uh, the opera world by storm. She was a black soprano uh, that had fire and brimstone and everything she did. She was an extraordinary actress. She had studied at Juilliard. And I had the good fortune of when I was auditioning for grad school, um, um, uh, I went to Curtis, but I also had to audition at Juilliard in Manhattan. And my coach at the North Carolina School of the Arts in my undergrad was Clamadell's uh, teacher. And I was staying at my coach's house in New York who had to go out of town. And she said to Clamadell, this young man is up from South Carolina. He needs a place to stay for one night before he leaves New York. Could you possibly take him in? So she did. And I slept under her baby grand piano uh, on a Saturday night. <laughs> I mean, it almost, it really changed my life. First of all, she was the most glamorous person I'd ever seen in my life. She was taller than the Empire State Building. She was so gracious and beautiful and uh, fed me Chinese food and then threw me a sleeping bag and locked her door. And so <laughs> there I was until the morning. And I, and I, I set this up in this way because uh, what happened is Porgy and Bess came to town, Clamadale was starring uh, an old friend from South Carolina had a friend who couldn't go, had an extra ticket, took me, and that changed my life. After the concert, I, I figured out how to get backstage to see Clama, then invited me to the cast party. She told them I was this brilliant singer, even though she had never heard me sing. And I auditioned, and my teacher cried because it meant I was going to leave the school. She said for three months, I said, okay, two and a half years later, traveling the world, singing Porgy and Bess, um, uh, the role of Jake uh, in every major European and American capital. <laughs> so before we get to the next chapter, tell us, how did your travels in Europe inspire your cooking? Well, you know, interestingly enough, the cooking um, and the music were always my counterparts. And when I was singing and performing, uh, then the, 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 um, the food uh, was my research and my, 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 um, uh, the way I fed my soul. So imagine a, 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 a young man from South Carolina being exposed to the capitals of Europe and the most exquisite, fine dining, extraordinary food uh, imaginable. Uh, it, it left an indelible impression on me because it was when I understood the translation and the transition between mama's cooking, between, um, you know, uh, Miss Hattie and Miss Magnolia's, you know, finest dishes at the, at the church picnic, how that translated to a fine dining scenario. I mean, essentially, fine dining is taking the, the taste, the flavor, the heritage, the history of home food and putting it in a new, modern, contemporary, fashionable container, um, much like a technique, really. And so I started to look at Southern food through those lens, and I understood that there was not only work to do, but I could do it. And, um, and essentially that was the turning point for me. 
in how I saw myself in the food arena. All right. So you, we talked about the the meals, the music, and you know our wonderful friends are are keeping track of time, Alexander. <laughs> like, Love it, Cortez. Um, how do we get? Bring, I'm going to ask you a, a multi prong question. Bring us to your returning to New York, Harlem, and coming full circle with uh, being able to celebrate and honor the meals, the music, the history, the journey in what the low country cooking, the ex experiences that at Cafe Bula, like, tell me how yeah. you put you put it lasso up all of this rich, I'm gonna call it a gumbo, that your <laughs> wife is kind of throwing into the pot. Well, look, I mean, basically, I was studying at the Paris Opera House. Um, I was singing better than I'd ever sung before. Uh, one of my dearest, closest friends, whom you know, Kathleen Battle, I reached out to her and I asked her if she would get me an audition at the Met, which was going to be my third audition. She did. I flew in from Paris and I was being represented by Cami Artists, the, one of the best uh, classical management companies on the planet. And I had my audition. And normally when you audition at the Met, you sing an aria and you start another one. And then they tell you what they think. I sang two arias and started another. And then they started to tell me what they thought. Uh, they praised my uh, progress and, and my maturity and all the things that, um, uh, you know, I had accomplished uh, those many, many years living uh, in Europe, uh, Rome, Paris, Florence, uh, some time in Germany and London. And then they said to me, listen, we are going to do our first um, major production of Porgy and Bess. And we would love for you to do some small roles in chorus. Now, what you have to understand about that is I had already won a Grammy and a Tony for a major role in Porgy and Bess. I'd also sang my last Porgy and Bess. I was looking for uh, Puccini, Verdi. I was looking for Wagner. I was looking to really solidify myself as one of the major uh, players. And that opportunity was not presented. Uh, so I left there. I just simply told them I was not interested. I left. Uh, I walked home. I was living on the Upper West Side at the time. And probably the first time in my life, I drank a whole bottle of red wine, which I'd smuggled in my suitcase um, <laughs> uh, from Paris uh, that night. And the next morning, I was very clear that I was done. That experience said to me that not only did I have to own a seat at the table, I had to own the table. And while I couldn't own an opera house, my great love of food and dining and restaurant and entertaining. I was going to take my living room public and I was going to open my first restaurant. And so I decided based on the culinary uh, exposure, education, all of the fine food that I experienced uh, in the European capitals, that it was going to be the first fine dining African-American restaurant in New York City um, with all the accoutrements. And so less than two years later, this is where my restaurant story began. <laughs> and you know, um, it's funny because you and I met at a restaurant. Yes. <laughs> and I was still singing opera when we met. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I, I thought I was going to be a singer myself at that time. Um, oh, you know, that's. You sang. You sang, girl. 
hey. you were sang and playing that ukulele. My ukulele. <laughs> Don't let a ukulele come near me. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody sits down until uh. I'm finished. Alexander, a uh, couple questions before we kind of talk about some questions from the the, the grantees. Yes. Um, I heard somebody once say, oh, you do soul food. Correct people, what is the difference? Because you don't, first of all. So what is, uh, educate us. Okay, so... You know, what I want to say about soul food, which is a very endearing term and really describes a culture, a legacy, uh, a, 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 a brilliant expression in our culture. I mean, I think if I'm correct, it started with jazz musicians who really wanted to qualify their kind of eating. And um, it was co-opted by corporate America, uh, you know, by folks who are not us uh, and given all kinds of other weights and burdens and stereotypes that we had to survive. My uh, coming of age in a culinary setting, it was very important for me. And you have to understand, we're talking about um, the, the late 80s and early 90s, essentially when, when it was very important to define a platform for uh, black chefs and black folks who cook that could survive the stigma of, oh, he cooked soul food. I cannot tell you how many times I was introduced, uh, especially by white friends, to their friends or saying, oh, he's a, he's a, a he, they would say he's a cook and he makes the best soul food you've ever tasted. Not allowing what I really did which was a regional cooking and um, fine dining to survive beyond the soul food moniker, badge. So I was really, really uh, aggressive. And there was a food critic who I owe a great uh, deal to who helped put my first uh, uh, restaurant on the map and who will na remain nameless. But she was doing uh, an article and I was prominently featured and we were doing the interview and I was talking about my food much through the lens of classic um, uh, uh, fine dining. Uh, and then she said, yeah, but it's soul food. And I said, no, it's not. So and then she said, well, uh, you know, you, you have fried chicken on the menu. I said, well, it's fried poisson, if you really want to know. She said, and you have um, you know, stewed collard greens. I said, actually, they're salty. And she said, and you have cornbread and you're black. It's soul food. And I said, I beg to differ. And if you want a story that mirrors what I'm really doing, um, then you'll write that it's low country cooking, that it's Southern revival cooking based on low co country cooking and not soul food. So the point to all of that was I was fighting for the lives of black chefs to be able to be in the kitchen without the, the, the stereotype of what corporate America wanted to bring to our offerings. That's yeah, it. I, I, and and cha changing the, the gaze on, yeah, the mindset. you know, and recentering f f who, where the perspective comes from that defines. Um, I'm going to transition us to some amazing questions that we have from the grantees. Um, and, and this is uh, actually a, a good handoff. So uh, one of our grantees is asked, you know, who are some of the pioneers who inspire you the most? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mentioned Edna Lewis earlier, an extraordinary woman who I had the opportunity to know uh, and value. Um, uh, Leah Chase, the, the Dookie Chase family, um, the queen of, of Southern cooking uh, of New Orleans. Uh, these were extraordinary pioneers. I mean, literally, literally people who set the foundation for, uh, for 
me being able to do what I do. Alberta Wright, Alberta Wright, another uh, South Carolina low country um, uh, woman who opened Jezebel's um, and, and, you know, really created a wonderful continental upscale um, um, uh, eatery uh, and, and eventually opened one in Paris. Uh, these are my, my sheroes, if you will. And also, let me give a nod to B. Smith, um, who essentially, you know, armed with her designer bag and her graciousness and her knowledge of, of hospitality and entertaining, you know, really created something very, very special um, in New York uh, that preceded me. And, and you know, I give, I give these women uh, tremendous praise and, and gratitude. And I'm sure I've left out some, but yeah. Well, def definitely these are all incredible pioneers who, and their legacy still continues. I, I So many people reference them if, if they are on this excursion. Uh, another question from a grantee is, how do you find motivation for your work during this pandemic? Well, I won't say that it isn't difficult. Um, you know, one thing I have in my favor is I always say I'm truly a professional dreamer, you know, so that I don't get to turn off. So I'm always dreaming about new ideas and new things um, uh, to uh, a new opportunity, because I always feel that there's a silver lining in every dark cloud. And it's up to us. It's part of our, our mission in life. But the other thing I rest upon is the foundation of the ancestors and the gifts I've been given. I cannot afford to be idle or non-productive. I cannot afford not to look um, for that next wave of insight and purpose. So, you know, when you are built that way, no matter what's happening, no matter what's going on, imagine, you know, our, our ancestors, ancestors who um, faced great adversity and still had to figure out, you know, not only how to stay alive, but also how to change their condition. So, you know, I mean, what I'm doing is child's play. <laughs> I mean, in comparison, you know, I just keep going because every step I make, uh, you know, is really purposeful and it's where I should be going. Well, no, but but I mean, don't I, I? I have to say, being an entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur of a black entrepreneur, a Latina, um, is is it, it, you have to work from a dream, and then you have to move it to a reality, yes. um, and you have to learn how to turn no's into yeses, but. What I've gotten, you know, from our conversation is is that's where our legacy comes from. Absolutely. Despite a long way, the ever you experienced on the road with your grandparents, when you go to, you know, your career in opera, the in and and but you're always moving through it, following yeah. your heart, and also creating something and 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 that is i think you know what we have to lean into during this most challenging time which is affecting our communities dramatically so we're we're i'm i'm looking at my clock and and what i want to know is so what's coming up out of you know this 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 last 6 months of lockdown I'm working on what's what's next for you well, let me just let me just say this with respect to wrapping up what we were just talking about. You know, what comes to mind for me is that old Negro spiritual. Sit down, servant, I can't sit down. Sit down, servant, I can't sit down. Sit down, servant, I can't sit down. My soul so happy that I can't sit down. <laughs> We continue. All right. So 
what else is going on in the world of Alexander. I'm really excited about a couple of things. Uh, next week, uh, I have a, 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 a cover feature in Food and Wine uh, uh, that I'm happy to say my dear friend Lisa Cortez was a part of and attended. Uh, it's exciting because they have worked really hard to tell the story that I wanted to tell. I've never felt so um, um, empowered uh, with, you know, one of these magazines uh, because they moved heaven and earth to really, really tell the story. So I'm very excited. So that's something to look forward to. Um, and I'm very excited that I've just signed a contract to do my first children's book, um, which has been a dream for so long. And, uh, you know, it, it will be my fourth <laughs> book and hopefully the start of something really special. Anything else on the music oh. side? Last but not least, <laughs> and that's what friends are for. I've just completed my first recording in at least 30 years uh, called Let Us Break Bread Together. It really is a, a, a collection of songs that speak to the African-American songbook. Um, I was very fortunate to have two extraordinary producers who really, uh, one in particular, uh, Ulysses Owens Jr., who really brought me to the well, and uh, Robert Satan, who made the well work for me. Um, so that should be out uh, next February. So that's going to be fun. <laughs> that was no, a great, great treat. Um, Last question, meals, music. Any muses you want to tell us about? Oh my, oh my. Well, you know, I've had a life full of muses. <laughs> um, let me just say this uh, as a final note. I am so grateful and thankful for some of the most extraordinary people who've touched my life. Uh, in so many ways, some of them who were my heroes that really became uh, partners, um, supporters, people that carried me the distance. Very thankful for Toni Morrison, who wrote one of the first checks uh, to support my first restaurant, Felicia Rashad, the great Percy Sutton, who, um, you know, saw something in me, um, you know, and uh, told me about it. Uh, at a White Castle one afternoon uh, in Harlem. <laughs> and, you know, really to so many extraordinary people that have, uh, with their light, lit my way so I could do what I do. So that's my muse. I'm thankful. And you included, my, my, my darling, dearest friend. Uh, thank you, sweetheart. Anything to say, to share about Harlem? Because I know it, it really informs your life in, in so many ways. I have been trying to get to Harlem all my life. My father had a stop in Harlem on his way from World War II. Actually, he got to World War II when it was over. So they just sort of sent him to India where he got in trouble and then stopped in Harlem where his sister and my Uncle Joe, his brother, were chefs. And, and my mother, poor thing, was waiting at home to be married. Uh, finally, my uncle sent her there. But that, those stories, those stories, uh, my uncle's stories, my father's stories that I had to hear every Sunday morning when he shined his 50,000 shoes on the side porch. Um, the fact that I all my life thought I would live here and in 1998 made that happen. And I have been so happy here. I love Harlem. I love being involved in um, uh, organizations here in Harlem and the people. And I proudly, you know, live on Sugar Hill. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, Alexander, I, I thank you. You know, I was uh, said to Alexander, I'm, I'm the, the little sister he didn't know he needed. <laughs> and I appreciate your 
letting me occupy that space. Um, I thank you for introducing me to the incredible work of the Citizens Committee for New York City and for this um, very rich celebratory conversation. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I am thank going you for coming to on the journey with me, Lisa. Oh yes, <laughs> I can't wait for the next the next uh, stop. Oh, uh, it might be the Krispy Kreme on 125th Street, but yeah, that yeah. worked for me. Uh, <laughs> I would like to now, as a, as the kids in hip hop would say, pass the mic to Paul. Hey hey. We can't hear you. How is that? That better? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'll blame it on the dog hitting the mute button. I know, um, Paul mute. We, I've been involved with Citizens Committee for, I think, seven or eight years. The last five as chairman, I've met a lot of fantastic people throughout New York, and I am very happy to add the two of you to the list. Alexander, especially because it's very rare when you have somebody who's a triple threat, a chef, an opera singer, and a White Castle lover. And I just got to tell you, that's a special place in my heart. Okay, I grew up in Queens. Um, I live in Connecticut now, and unfortunately, there are no White Castles up here, so I literally have to travel to get to one. Uh, but, but thank the two of you very, very much. I, I'm thrilled to meet you, and and, and thank you for doing this. Uh, for everybody who's watching, please remember, for a donation over $250, you're going to get a very, very special book. It's Alex, excuse me, Alex's book, personally signed by him. So please. Use the QR code. There's the book right there. Lisa's holding it up. Use the QR code and make your donation now. You can also watch this video at any time later on. It'll be posted on Facebook. But there it is. In and out. Uh, <laughs> but please make your donation. Um, you know, these are two wonderful New Yorkers, and they're a great example of, of what New Yorkers are and what they do. And uh, we, we need to help everybody else who needs that help right now. Okay? New Yorkers helping New Yorkers. That's what it's all about. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. This was a great evening. We have one more event coming up on September 29th. That will be our culminating event with a lot of programs. So please sign up for that. Again, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.